happens to work throughout the tour. Greg, can you look this way? All over the constant patients. We're going to get started right here in the Con Hot Meadow. The first animals we're going to see, if you look straight ahead, the bright caramel colored oh, deer are the Barasinga deer. Barasinga deer get their name from their antlers. Once those antlers are fully grown, they'll, they'll have about 12 to 14 tines or points on them. And Barasinga means 12 tines in Hindi. Now, there is another group of deer in this field. If, if you're closer towards me, you're going to want to look to the left. But if you're all the way in the back, you're going to want to really look straight ahead. And you'll see a, a group of pale colored deer. Those are back tree deer. Back tree deer are native to the deserts of the Middle East. Males have antlers and the females do not. Now we do have a couple other species of deer and a species of antelope in this field. Baby. So cute. Let's hear from one of our zookeepers, Michelle. She's going to tell you all about those animals and what goes into caring for them. Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm part of the Wild Asian Keeper Team. We call this area Kaka Meadow, where we care for about 40 Barasinga deer, 15 Axis deer, 10 Black Buck, and a pair of Hunt We start our day by checking on all the animals, making sure they are healthy, behaving normally, and safe. The calves are born over the Horns are given a neonatal exam, which include weighing, vaccination, and tagging for identification purposes. While the animals are in the meadow, Alrighty, folks, in just a moment, we are going to round a corner. And after we round the corner, we're going to see a couple of really special species of horse. Before we see the horses, though, I just want to let you know that an antler is not part of an animal skeleton, so animals that grow antlers tend to grow and then shed them all within the span of one year. And then they do this at least once every single year of their life. And now, folks, take a look over to the right-hand side, and you're going to see some of our Mongolian wild horses, also known as Schwalski's horse. Now, Mongolian wild horses are a very special species of horse for many reasons, chief among which is Jeez. that they were once considered extinct in the wild. And when an animal is extinct in the wild, that means they no longer exist in the wild. So for decades, the only place you could find a Mongolian wild horse was at a zoo in either North America or Asia. That was until around the 1960s, which is when all of those zoos came together and created a plan to help the species survive. Part of that plan was to reintroduce Mongolian wild horse back into its natural habitat, and we've been able to do that successfully so far. Our work's not done yet, though. We'll not rest until the Mongolian wild horse is truly wild once again. More on that, let's hear from one of our field coordinators, Jonathan Slad. Jonathan Slad, from the Russia and Northeast region of Fort Lee, the Florida Much smaller, much lighter colored gower. 
But if you look over to the left of the gallery, you're going to see our brow antler deer. The brow antler deer are given that name because when their antlers are fully grown in for the season, they look just like eyebrows. And we've got a few more brow antler deer over here to the right. Now, brow antler deer are unfortunately victims of habitat loss. Habitat loss occurs when an animal loses their natural habitat to human activities such as farming. And it gets to such a drastic point that the animal becomes either vulnerable or endangered. We here at WCS are working with local governments all over the world to help keep this problem to an absolute oh, minimum. Oh my God. We're coming up with solutions that work for both the people that use the land oh, and the wild here. animals that live on you it. See the tiger? And work in ways that benefit oh, both. Here's how we're doing that in Indonesia, WCS. Many different kinds of fruit and vegetables. 
she can pick up that fruit with her trunk because her trunk has a special finger like appendage at the front of it that allows her to pick things up like even blades of grass. She can pick up dirt with it. She can pick up the fruit that I mentioned before. She can also grab hold of entire tree branches and tear them down off of trees with tremendous force. They have a lot of dexterity in their trunks, Asian elephants. Now another interesting thing I want to mention, something I saw last week during that heat wave. So one one thing that I do, and I'm sure I'm not the, I'm sure I'm not alone, when it's really hot and I want something refreshing, I'll cut up a, I'll cut up a watermelon. And when it was really hot last week, the zookeepers cut up watermelons and placed them around the exhibit for the Asian for our Asian elephants to eat. And folks, they were gone so fast. I went on one tour, the watermelon were there, my next tour around, they were gone. So I think it's pretty fair to assume that elephants also love to eat watermelon as a nice refreshing snack on a hot summer's day. And now folks, speaking of animals doing human-like things on hot summer's day to cool on hot summer days to cool down, we have our Indian rhino exhibit that we're passing through right now. And right now, Penny is out here. She's gonna be all the way over to the right hand side. We're gonna come up to her in just a moment. She is likely gonna be hanging out in her mud wallow. Now a mud wallow is essentially a very large, very deep mud puddle that's created by the Indian rhinos, both in the wild and here at the Bronx Zoo. And they do that for a very important reason. And that reason has to do with their skin. Rhino skin is incredibly sensitive to the sun and to insects, just like our skin is. So zookeepers have to put, have to, I got a little ahead of myself there. So since their skin is so sensitive, the rhinos create these mud wallows and sit in them and cover themselves with mud. That mud will act as a natural sunblock and a natural bug repellent for them. And over here on the right hand side, we've got Penny doing just that, going for a soak in her mud wallow. Now, Penny has a lot of white stuff on her face right now. That white stuff is sunscreen, believe it or not. Zookeepers have to put sunscreen on Penny's face every single day because her skin is more sensitive than the average rhino. And if you want to learn more about how zookeepers put sunscreen on the face of a 3,500 pound Indian yeah, rhinoceros, you can watch it happen on our TV show, Animal Planet the Zoo. I believe that particular segment is in season three. Folks, just another quick reminder to please remain seated. If you've got kids, make sure they're sitting down as well. Turn on the slide. Let me see. The rhinos you see here are Indian rhinos. We work with habitats all over the world that are home to rhinos. Here is a note from our field office in Sumatra. At Mulan, works with the Sumatra rhinos. Sumatra rhinos are the smallest of the world rhinos. The name Nilgai actually refers to the male Nilgai antelope. 
again, we don't have any nails out now. Otherwise, I would show you. But the males have a bluish gray coat and horns on, on their heads. So they kind of resemble blue colored bulls. And in Hindi, nil guy means blue bull. Folks, if you look all the way over to the back right hand side of this of this exhibit, you're going to see the nil guy antelope a little bit more in the sun, but right up against the fence behind them are the sandbar deer. Remember, the sandbar deer are much darker than the nil guy antelope. Speaking of deer with dark colored coats, the deer that live in this next exhibit have a very chocolatey brown colored coat. And if you take a look all the way to the back, folks, all the way towards that back fence to the right of a tree that's right along the fence, you're going to see a Chinese tufted deer. That's actually a rare sight for today because Chinese tufted deer do not like hot weather as much. As much. They're from an area in China where it doesn't really ever get this hot. So they hardly ever come out on days when it's hot like this. This is the first time I have seen one today, actually. And they're really small, folks. It is hard to see them anyway. They only weigh about 40 pounds. My dog weighs more than that. But they do something really cool with their tails that I want to talk about. Their tails have a white stripe around them that allow for easy visibility by other types of deer because they can communicate with their tails. For example, say there was a group of tufted deer hanging out somewhere and one of them saw a predator off in the distance. Instead of making a sound, she might stick her tail up in the air instead. And that will alert the others silently that there is a predator nearby and that they need to make a quick and easy getaway. And they'll be able to do that without making a sound. Folks, look straight down in this next exhibit. You're gonna see a goat in a tree. You're gonna see a goat in the tree. Look at the very bottom of the hill and you're gonna see a goat in a tree. That goat is a markhor. The markhor are some of the large goat species in the world. If you missed the goat in the tree, don't worry. Once we get around the corner, look straight ahead and maybe down a little bit and you'll see it. Now, the markhor are excellent climbers and I'm gonna talk more about that in a moment. But I wanna mention first that the males have long corkscrew shaped horns, long beards and manes of hair around their necks. Females have shorter beards, shorter horns, and no mane. Now the markhor can climb that well thanks to special rubber-like cores in their hooves that kind of make them act like hiking boots. And they can easily get up steep rock faces and as we saw, even trees. Markhor can also jump six feet straight up in the air without a running start. And for reference, the doors that you entered the monorail in, the doors that are right behind you, give or take a few inches, those doors are roughly six feet tall. And now, folks, this tree that we passed by that looks like there should be an animal in within it is normally home to one of our red pandas, Linus, but Unfortunately, it is just way too hot for Linus today, so he is not out. But if you do want to see another one of our red pandas, you might have a better luck over at the Himalayan Highlands exhibit. We do have another red panda out there. We also have snow leopards, and as a big snow leopard fan, I strongly recommend it. And now, folks, look straight ahead at the meadow in front of us. If you're closer to me, look to the left. If you're towards the back, look to the right. Through the fence, you might, you'll see, excuse me, you will see three goats that look kind of similar to the Markhor, but are actually a little, a little different. Those are the Himalayan Tar, T-A-H-R. They're a little smaller than the Markhor, and their horns are different. They're three females, so their horns curl backwards and point towards the backs of their skulls. They can climb just as well as the Markhor can, though, because they too have those rubber-like cores in their hooves. Now, folks, let me let let me let you in on something else that we've got going on here at the Bronx Zoo today. It's called Eric Carl's World of Wildlife. No doubt you've been seeing little little pieces of it all throughout the zoo today. Let me tell you what's going on with it. So, we are celebrating one of the most beloved children's authors to ever put pen to paper. I'm sure I'm not the only one on this train who grew up with Eric Carl's books. And we're going to be featuring performances of some of his most cherished classics, including The Very Hungry Caterpillar, which is happening over at the Giraffe Corner by the Giraffes. Brown Bear, Brown Bear, what do you see? 
over at the Grizzly Corner near the Bears, the Very Busy Spider is over by Astor Court, and on Fridays through Sundays, we also have the artist who painted a blue horse going on by Astor Court. Now we're going to get moving in just a second here, folks. We're just stopping at a stop sign. In fact, by the time I'm done with this sentence, we are going to be moving forward. But yeah, folks, I strongly recommend you go and enjoy any or all of those performances. It's going to be a wonderful time. Whether or not you grew up with Eric Carle's books, he, you've definitely heard of his stories before, most likely. It's going to be a great time, folks. I strongly recommend it. Just like, how, just like I strongly recommend going to Jungle World if you haven't been there yet today, and you've already been to the other two things that I just mentioned. Jungle World is an award-winning walkthrough exhibit that gets you up close with all kinds of animals that live in the Asian rainforests. You can also learn more about the human impact on rainforests all around the world and what you can do to help. Now, folks, we're pulling up to the platform right now, which means the tour is about to come to an end. Thank you so much for joining me today. You've been wonderful. My name is John. I was your tour guide. Watch your step as you exit the train. Stay hydrated. Drink plenty of water today. It's really hot. And have a lovely rest of your day here at the Bronx Zoo.